The Arabian Persian Gulf is located in the center of the Middle East. On the southern coast is the state of Qatar, which occupies a peninsula of just under 11,500 square kilometers, an area almost 200 times smaller than Saudi Arabia. Until the 20th century, the peninsula's chief resources came from the sea. At its widest point, the country measures only 80 kilometers across. A multitude of islands surround this territory, which for the most part is a vast, flat desert, whose climate and arid soil are inhospitable to natural vegetation. In winter, heavy rainfalls are common, and yet color returns to the desert. The rigorous management of water and methodical distribution systems allow the desert to flower at the height of summer. While coming out of its shell, Qatar for many years concentrated on the pearl oyster. The pearl launched the economy of this country, and the Al Thani family has given the country its constitution and its fame. Located on the east coast, Doha, the capital, has been completely transformed over the past 50 years. 80% of the country's population lives in Doha. The ultra-fast growth of this emirate, which proclaimed its independence in 1971, does not conflict with its respect for tradition. The state of Qatar has chosen health, welfare and education as its top national priorities. The same importance is given to physical education and sports. The country's high aims in this area are reflected by the number of international sporting events which are hosted here. But here, the digital revolution goes hand in hand with ancestral customs. Only one third of the population are of Qatari origin. The others are foreign expatriates who constitute a wealth of know-how and the workforce that is indispensable to the national economy. The customs are those of a country where Islam is practiced by virtually the entire population. Qatar is a moderate Islamic country. Religious convictions are adapted to the present-day world. Integrating housing with the environment reveals the same sense of adaptation. For centuries, the nomadic tribes learned to live in a hostile environment. Once they became settled, the nomads still based their idea of home on the tent. As a shelter from the wind, sand and sun, there was no better protection. Light and fluid lines contrasted with the forms of architecture imported by Western civilizations at the beginning of the 16th century. The country ignited considerable foreign commercial interest in the mid 20th century. The wealth obtained from pearl fishing was not all that people had their eye on. A new pearl had arisen from the soil, representing a veritable treasure trove, the third largest natural gas reserve in the world. The gas and oil furnish 85% of export income. They also supply the power to produce electricity. Development depends on power lines that transport electricity. Like magic, the desert has been transformed. It isn't always easy to distinguish between a mirage and reality. The camel, the ship of the desert, has adapted to city life, while automobiles cross the desert. Qatar is traveling through time in massive strides. Over a thousand years of history are behind its great march toward the future. Economic growth is steady in a country that has approximately one million inhabitants. But the pearl of the past has not been forgotten. The shell and its graceful shape influences urban planners and architects in designing the building complexes of tomorrow. Reclaimed from the desert, Doha was founded in the mid-1800s when it became a British protectorate. Along the seafront, the Corniche stretches seven kilometers towards the futuristic forms of the West Bay Quarter. 
Doha was originally a small fishing village, but time flies. The Doha Corniche is a meeting place for strollers. On Fridays, the dhows, the traditional boats, disembark entire families. They come here to picnic on the grass at the foot of the modern buildings. Although no clothing restrictions are imposed on the women, most of them wear the long black abaya. At the edge of West Bay, the first architects had already proven their sense of originality. Today, a veritable forest of skyscrapers has seen the day. There was, in fact, no real need to build high-rises because of all the space available. The buildings are in themselves the outward sign of success, and Doha has great expectations for the future. An architecture without constraints has led to the fusion between tradition and modernity. Ibrahim Jada, architect. The sky is your, really is your limit he, here in Qatar as an architect. In a lot of places in Europe uh, and in the West, you are very much limited to the surrounding uh, buildings. Here, the sky is your limit in terms of style, height, function, and there is usually daring ideas here in Qatar. And why not have Venetian gondoliers rowing at the foot of the buildings? Yes, it often takes daring because ambition is high and nothing is impossible. But it's surely not that simple. The major problem is with the scale we are not really used to. Only five, six years ago, Qatar has started going high. Usually we go horizontal. So the challenge here is to go very high, yet maintain a sort of uh, a flavor of where it belongs. And that we tend to lose that identity when it becomes extremely high. Everywhere, oriental lines rival in elegance with western curves. The flourishing economy of the state of Qatar rests on solid ground. The government has chosen to diversify its resources by turning the capital into an important financial center. For example, Hamar al-Kabir Street is where all the banks are where everything tends to turn the color of gold, even the pearls. But here, no one forgets that it all started with the pearls that were fished from the water's depths at the price of considerable effort. It is also impossible to ignore the Islamic influence. It is the axis around which Qatar winds. The spiral of the minaret follows the path of a world in movement. All the components of traditional society remain ever present, but are updated. The architecture of the Museum of Islamic Arts is a good example of this. Its subtle play on cubes was conceived by the creator of the Louvre Pyramid, the American architect, Liu Ming Pei. Madame Sabia Al Kamir is curator of the museum. When asked to design the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha, Ayam Pei embarked on a long journey throughout the Islamic world. He was looking for the essence of Islamic architecture. And that journey went from North Africa to Iraq to Egypt, you know, everywhere in the Middle East. And really, what Pei did is taking Islamic architecture the root of tradition to modernity. The objects that are exhibited here come from three continents. They span 13 centuries of a brilliant civilization. They range from pottery, glass, metalwork, um, carpets, basically from earthenware to silk, and from Cordoba in Spain to Samarkand in Central Asia. It's a wide geographical area, and it is from the seventh century when Islam came to nowadays. Very close to the museum and in the shadow of the skyscrapers is a boatyard out of time, where the dhows are built according to the ancient techniques. The dhow is a commonly used boat in the Indian Ocean, 
and particularly along the Gulf coasts. They are usually built out of teak, a wood that does not rot. The hull is assembled using wooden pegs, and the stern has a square shape. One of the properties of teak is to harden after it's wet. Another tradition, the souk, a word which in Arabic signifies old city market. The old Doha souk has been restored and has maintained all of its activities, which are divided into different sections. Traditional musical instruments, preparation of the traditional bread, Everything here reflects an aspect of the past. Inside the souk, jewels, gems and precious metals have been crafted by Qatari jewelers for generations. Early on, artisans had prime material available here, which was highly prized the world over, natural pearls. Today, the pearls are imported. This is the grandson of a pearl fisherman. He is a pearl salesman and also an artist who creates wonderful images by using woods of different nuances. His works sometimes recall the intricate craft of his ancestors. With an extraordinary feel for detail, he uses real pearls for a special highlighting effect, a work of great finesse. There are two things combined in this art of woodworking. The art of the sculpting, such as in creating the image of the emir, and also the art of assembling the many shades of wood. There are an incredible number of pieces of wood in these portraits. A three-dimensional image, more expressive than a photograph. In the fruit and vegetable souk, it is surprising to see such a variety of produce and colors especially considering the limited possibility of agriculture in Qatar. That's why most of the produce in the stalls arrives from all over the world. Bulky products and moving merchandise are sold at another souk. The harsh desert climate and the absence of pasture land are obstacles to animal breeding. Tradition is important in Qatar. Nevertheless, the country has not shut itself off from the present. It is resolutely turned outward, toward the future. In keeping with that goal is Al Jazeera, the satellite television channel created by the Emir in 1996. It has become one of the leading news channels in the world while presenting the news from the Arab point of view. The station has built a memorial to journalists who have been killed on the job. The Freedom Wall is a reminder of their dedication to the profession and of the risks involved. A museum has been created with a number of personal items that belong to journalists employed by the channel and who died while covering the news. To prepare for the future, Qatar has created the Qatar Foundation, chaired by Her Royal Highness, the wife of the Emir. Considerable funds have been invested to help all of the Qatari people meet the challenges that await them. By keeping to the lines of traditional architecture, but also by calling upon the masters of contemporary architecture, an immense complex has been built, Education City. A simple idea, but a daring one. To found a campus not by establishing one university, but by grouping several of the best universities in the world on the same site. 
with the astronomical scale of investment, the state-of-the-art techniques, and top professors recruited throughout the world have rapidly given international renown to this achievement. The size of the projects that have been endowed by the Qatar Foundation is in keeping with the measure of its ambitions. The new convention center will be the largest in all the Middle East. The palm trees are wondering where their desert went. Qatar created monumental plans for the Al Khalifa Stadium. With state-of-the-art sports architecture design, a 320-meter high tower in the shape of a flame dominates the city of sports. Organizing high-level sporting events has made Qatar famous worldwide. But first, the desert had to be conquered. The Doha Golf Club organizes the Qatar Masters. The feat is remarkable, since the 18-hole course calls for ducks in the middle of the desert and among the cactus plants. The grass here is such a luxury one would think the golf balls are pearls. Horses have always accompanied the nomad populations of the Middle East. They have belonged to Arab culture for centuries. For horse breeding and training, Qatar has become a top place. Horses are one of the Emir's great passions. His horse farms are famous the world over, and his horses have won many prizes. In Qatar, another animal that the Qataris are devoted to is the falcon. This bird of prey belongs to an age-old tradition which makes bird and master hunting partners. The falcons have their own hospitals. The bird is often wounded because it hunts by impacting its prey at high speed. Fractures are frequent. The falcon wakes up and is ready to go back to work. We're all set for a hunting expedition in the desert. The prey is released. The falcon takes off. The falconer keeps the bird in sight. The bird swoops down on its prey, which doesn't stand a chance. The falcon is the fastest animal in all creation. Heading west across the desert. We see familiar silhouettes, another animal that is traditionally present. On the horizon, a tent camp has been set up in the Bedouin style. Qataris are very attached to their ancestral customs and way of life without foregoing the advantages of the modern world. At the campsite, the customary division of labor is respected. It is the women who make the ornaments worn by the camels. They also prepare the awamats or fritters and other traditional dishes. Everyone is here in honor of the animal that makes their existence in the desert possible, the camel. For the camel, the day begins with a good shower. Uh, 
Lots of people like camels. For me, they're my hobby. Camel races are extremely popular here. I still have my Bedouin soul, you know. Qataris are passionate fans of this event. Camel racing. We begin with a little warm-up. A strange silhouette has appeared on the racetrack. It's a robot, and it's being dressed up like a jockey. The whip is operated by remote control voice signals. Or by pressure on a keychain. The camels used to be ridden by children. Qataris were the first to adopt the use of robotic jockeys. Ever since, all the jockeys weigh exactly the same. As starting time draws closer, the camels must line up in the direction of the race. And there are no exceptions to this rule. Everything is soon taken care of. Ready? Go! The camels are off, accompanied by a group of cars. The track is bordered by two lanes, used by the camel owners to drive alongside the race, piloting their SUVs as well as their riders. Still in their pen, the females seem extremely nervous. They've had their hair done. They're wearing their best attire. What is going on? A jury of experts is about to judge which one is the prettiest. <laughs> General appearance and numerous other details are rigorously recorded. In a beauty contest, everything must be official. And the winner is... A new star is born, and the contest ends with dancing and singing. Further west, on the site of Zekrit, the sandy wind sculpts the limestone rocks according to its whim. In the play of shadows, the shapes are constantly changing. Here also, there is no limit to creativity. The west coast of Qatar lies on the Gulf of Bahrain. The large beaches could certainly accommodate a lot of sunbathers, but activity here is limited to the exploitation of oil. The country's principal oil fields are in fact located on the western coast. The pipelines wind their way throughout this region. Oil was discovered here by the British at the end of the 1930s. Qatar was entering a new era. Leaving the capital and heading north, the desert rapidly reclaims its rights. The further we go, the more barren the landscape becomes. The desert, however, is not just a vast stretch of land where life is unsustainable. 
Surprise! We find crops growing on carefully delineated plots of land. Another surprise, there is a great variety of crops. But the vegetation couldn't possibly survive without the aid of an irrigation system. They can even grow tomatoes, thanks to strict management of irrigation. With certain vegetables, local production supplies 70% of Qatar's consumption. Amazing! Dairy cows are raised in the desert. Animals that have low resistance to heat. Another animal bred here, Yorix. This animal, which is emblematic to Qatar, once thrived in the wild in this region, but came very close to extinction. Gazelles are also part of the local fauna. They have been almost wiped out by hunters, but today they thrive on breeding farms. They are highly valued for their meat and their hide. Further north, the desert road nears the sea. The towns face towards the Gulf, and their survival depends on it. The dhows are not used as pleasure boats, but as fishing boats. The port of Al Ruais is at the very northern tip of the peninsula. Fishing is one of the traditional activities of Qatar. Today, those who make a living as fishermen are immigrant workers. The Al Zubara fort was built in 1938 to guard against the dangers that came from the sea. At the time, Qatar was responding to the fortifications built in Bahrain. The region was already a hub of heavy commercial traffic. Munir Taha is an archaeologist. During the 18th and 19th century, Zubara was a trade center for the whole Arabian Gulf area. It was connected to the, uh, to the Basra from the north, Oman from the, from the south, and from there go to East Africa, to the west, and to the east, to the Indus Valley, up to China. On display inside the fort are objects found in the area during archaeological digs of the ruins. The city used to be a thriving trade center. There is a, an important port in, in, in Zubara, also mentioned in the historical uh, books. And Zubara also was famous in pearling industry. The pearls were exported to many countries. Zubara was an international port which you can use any sort of currency. The city of Zubara, protected by its ramparts as early as the 18th century, was ideally located. The importance of this site proves that the country's outward-looking orientation is not just recent history. Traveling south, Saudi Arabia is only 75 kilometers away. Immediately leaving the capital behind us is a region southwards where the law of the desert prevails. There will be no obstacles on the road other than immense sand dunes. Only the sea coast brings the desert to an end. To head south, we simply follow the coastline. An unexpected oasis appears between desert and sea. An oasis of comfort and tranquility. But suddenly, Bedouin horsemen appear in full regalia. 
the national colours fly proudly. Unexpected luncheon on the grass and young sports fans who let us in on what's going on. Of course, bicycles. In January, the Tour of Qatar starts off the cycling season under the direction of ex-champion Eddie Merckx. I think it's an ideal way to warm up for the season. The stages aren't too long, the cyclists come back to the same hotel every night, so it's the ideal way to get into condition. This is the only place in the country where the landscape seems to undulate. It's because of the Barkans, the crescent-shaped sand dunes. Tracks, silhouettes, shapes. Sand duning in four by fours has become a favorite pastime of the Qataris. sports field goes on forever. What's really interesting is finding dunes no one has ever driven on before, finding new terrain. It's a real hobby, you know? The terrain is constantly renewed because the wind regularly erases the tire tracks and the desert lends itself to all kinds of vehicles. The southern coast takes us to a channel that leads to a small inland sea. On the other side, Saudi Arabia. Tents seem like punctuation marks in the immensity. For several hours or several days, Qataris come to commune with the desert. It's a way of returning to their origins, which doesn't mean leaving the modern world behind. soon be night. For the day-trippers, it's time to get back to that other world. The moon illuminates Doha, lighting up rows of pearls. The desert has retreated. But the boundaries, both modern and traditional, are still there. The house lit up like a tent for the celebration. Ancestral customs taking place at the foot of the skyscrapers. The mosque is a landmark in the night. It's a wedding feast. The guests present their compliments. The men gather in one area, the women in another. The coffee pots are heated just as they are in the desert. Incense is still used as a sign of welcome. Along with dates. In the very heart of the modern city, tradition goes hand in hand with the present. Pearls of light bring on the traditional dances. 
a Bedouin dance reserved for very special occasions, the sword dance. After the dances, the feast. The traditional dish of lamb with rice called makbuz. You eat with the right hand and with the right hand only. Tomorrow, a new life begins for the bridegroom. In the shade or in the light, Qatar is in the process of meeting the challenge, reconciling identity with modernity. As in a waking dream, the country emerges straight from the desert, from tent to skyscraper, with almost no transition in between. It has raced into a new age. You have to rub your eyes to believe what you're seeing. To Arab poets of ages past, pearls were teardrops of the moon. The pearls of today have brought overwhelming change to the life of Qataris, but not to their essential values. They have become the pearls of the future.